turns out that it has important um, there's some there's some important reason why I include this chapter. Um, the first model that we're going to do is the model of Thompson. And uh, the interesting part here is that now we are going to have a control problem where not only you determine the optimal control over time, but we also determine the final time. And we already developed the theory of how to deal with when the final time capital T is also a variable. And the problems like that happens in real life because suppose you have a machine and you have to maintain this machine over time, but then you also have to sell the machine at some time. And uh, when to sell is a decision variable as well. There's a tradition in economics of what is the optimal lifetime of an asset. The problem goes back all the way to Ramsey um, about the optimal lifetime of an asset. And this is way before optimal control theory was developed. <clears throat> but the problem has been around. Um, there are, there's a survey, um, the forest management problems, and there are advertising copy management problems uh, of this kind, where you have an um, issue of finding a control as well as the lifetime um, of the problem. Okay. Um, this particular model that Thompson developed has a little bit of a history. Um, it turned out that when Pontryagin's book came out, some of the people decided that they want to learn this book. So at Carnegie Mellon, this responsibility fell on Jerry Thompson, who was my supervisor, not at the time. It, before my time. And uh, what Thompson did was, he will read the book <clears throat> chapter by chapter, and he will give the lecture to the Carnegie Mellon faculty and PhD students. And during the first batch of this course, uh, everybody was required to write a paper. And those papers are all published. Uh, Thompson wrote this paper. As a teacher of the class, he taught, wrote this paper. And that's published in management science. And we're going to cover that right now. Um, another professor who took that course was, um, the other two professors who took that course is Kamin and Schwartz. Mort Kamin was an economics professor, uh, moved to Northwestern recently passed away. Uh, his co-author, Nancy Schwartz, was also an economics professor. Um, Bob Lucas wrote a paper on research and development that was published in one of the economics journals. He went on to win the Nobel Prize. He went to the University of Chicago and, and won the Nobel Prize in economics. Um, there was another student named Bertel Nasland who went back to Sweden. And he wrote a paper also on machine replacement that was published in Swedish Journal of Economics. And uh, I visited Nashland uh, in Sweden many years ago. And uh, later on, Nashland became the chairman of the Nobel Prize Committee. And during this period, uh, one of the Carnegie Mellon professors named Herbert Simon who you may probably know uh, is, is called the father of artificial intelligence. Uh, he was not quite an economist, but in some sense he was. And uh, uh, 
during this time, and Nasland was a chair of the Swedish Royal Commission. And Herbert Simon actually got the Nobel Prize during this period. So you know there is some connection sometimes, uh, which helps. Um, life is not completely fair. I I wouldn't say that Herbert Simon did should not deserve the Nobel Prize. He's probably uh, one of the smartest people that I know. Uh, and uh, he probably deserves more than one Nobel Prize because he was a person who made enormous contribution in not just one field, but in many different fields. And uh, he was also part of this course. Um, we remember Hortmore de Gliani moved Simon model in chapter six. <clears throat> That Simon is the Simon that I'm talking about. Okay, so that's a little bit of history and that's related to this problem. Uh, T is the sale date of the machine to be determined. Rho is the discount rate. XT is the resale value of the machine in dollars at time T. We begin with X0. UT is preventive maintenance, means over and above the minimum required necessary repairs. You know, sometimes you have a minimum requirement that you have to do it, there's no optimality associated with it. But anything above that, you can decide to do or not do. And whatever you do has effectiveness. So GT is the effectiveness of your maintenance. It's a very simple model, but interesting. DT is the obsolescence function at time T. Uh, this is because the machine depreciates. Later on, I, I developed a model based on this model, where I decided that obsolescence is really what it is, not just depreciation. It also means that technology of the machine is changing. So the machine is becoming obsolete and you may buy a new machine before that old machine is no good. This happens in computer time period when computers were developed and uh, we bought computers um, even before the computer became non-functional because the new computer that came was so much more powerful that what you had was not good. Um, <clears throat> if you ever came to my office, down below my desk is my first computer. That was the first IBM PC that came out in the field. I, I bought one of the first computers and it's still there. I don't know if it's probably working, um, but it's, 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 uh, with a single-sided floppy drive, and within a year of floppy drives, they came up with double-sided floppy drives. So I bought double-sided floppy drives, <clears throat> I think $750 each, quite expensive. At that time, you know, and uh, double slide off it. I, it's the single sided sitting in my office, no use, it's still functioning. And a Hungarian professor came to visit me as a postdoc. And he said, what are you doing with single drives? I said, nothing. <laughs> he said, can I have it? I said, sure. He took it back to Hungary because they could not afford double sided or even single sided. So he got it and used them in Hungary. Okay. So obsolescence function will be used <clears throat> later in this chapter, which we will not cover today, but uh, you will be reading them. Pi is the constant production rate. And we have a discount rate row. Uh, it's reasonable to assume that GT is non-increasing non function of time. <clears throat> which means that the maintenance effectiveness goes down over time. And 
dt is non-decreasing means it increases over time. You, you become more and more obsolete. The maintenance can be bounded between zero and u. <clears throat> so, i is the productivity of the machine per, per dollar of the machine value. So, the idea being that the value of the machine, in some sense, is a surrogate measure of its productivity. So, this is your revenue from the machine. This is the cost of preventive maintenance. <clears throat> and this is the discount rate. And this is exactly the value of the machine at time t. And if you want to sell the machine at time t, then this is what you get at time t. So that's your objective function. This is the salvage value, this is this. And by having a state variable in this way, you end up having a salvage value exactly the state. Interesting part. Let's make it simple. Clearly, <clears throat> the, 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 the value of the machine is going to decline because of the salvage value. And it's going to increase because of the maintenance. But rather than increase, we will say <clears throat> that maintenance is not to increase the value of the function, but it is to slow down the decrease of the value function. Okay, which is more reasonable because usually old machine or old cars, unless you do different things, not maintenance, you cannot increase their value. Clearly, if you change the Vinyl seat to leather seats, you can increase the value. Clearly, if you change the ordinary tire to super duper tires, you can increase the value. So there are things you can do to a machine to increase this value. <clears throat> but that's not what we are talking about. So we're going to make an assumption that even if you make the highest amount of maintenance, you cannot defeat the obsolescence. That means no matter what you do with the machine, obsolescence will still be more than what you do. So this means that at best, you can slow down. At best, if it's equal to zero, then you can keep the machine at that value by having a capital U. <clears throat> I think this problem, uh, a source of many other problems that came, interesting problems, <clears throat> including one or two in the same course. We'll talk about that. I covered at least one problem from that course, two now, that and one more later. <clears throat> and when I was a student, I also, extended this problem and that would be the third one we will cover in this chapter so we'll cover three <clears throat> three machine replacement problems in this chapter and each one has a lesson which is different than the previous one so i've chosen that to give you a certain aspect of the problem uh, and i will tell you a little bit more about that okay Once we formulate the problem, we do maximum principle, Hamiltonian. We are using now, it's a finite horizon problem, so there is really not particular use of current value formulation, although you can do it if you want. We're doing the present value formulation. <clears throat> Lambda dot has no x on this side. So this problem can be solved all by itself. We will do that. And because t is not specified, we use a 
terminal condition, which is 3.15 in chapter 3. That gives you this. This is new now, right? Not new in terms of theory, but in terms of application. This is the first time in terms of functional application to a functional area. This is the first time we are, we are coming to this one. This can be solved. <clears throat> and you have a solution like that. Okay, it's a simple integration on the right hand side. And a big value of this paper in the time it was published was the economic interpretation of these eight things. Remember, Pontryagin's book has no economic interpretation. It's just a math book. Um, <clears throat> I have a, and did I tell you the story? I have a signed copy of the Pontryagin's book signed by Pontryagin, <clears throat> whom I met on an airport <laughs> in Vienna, uh, flying to uh, Kiev. And I was also flying to Kiev in Ukraine, in the old Ukraine, now it's new Ukraine, same thing. And uh, I asked Portriagin to sign the book and he gives the book to his wife and his wife signs it. So I had a book signed by L.S. Portriagin, the sign was in his, his wife. Okay. <clears throat> I'm, I'm told that that's, that's he, he, Pontryagin was blind since the age of two or three or whatever, <clears throat> and he never signed his own checks, I was told, so he's going to sign everything that he signed was his book, his wife's signature. Oh, yeah, <clears throat> the Lambda T interpretation. It gives, in present value terms, the marginal profit per dollar gain in resale value at time T. Remember that the state is resale value of the machine. This is the state. This. And if I increase the resale value by one dollar, that is the increase in the state variable. So if for some reason, if I can increase the state by one dollar, what do I get? If my beginning is x0, let's say 5, and if I change it to 6, how do I, what is the, the objective function value? Well, the objective function value will change by lambda, right? Lambda is our shadow price. So, the first term, because if I increase the value by $1, <clears throat> then it will, also increase the salvage value of the machine by one dollar. You can see here immediately, if you look at x0, you go by one dollar, there's no x here. So this x0, at, at some time, xt will also be there, but its value at time t is going to be exactly this, e to the minus rho times t. So the first term represent the present value of the $1 of additional salvage value at T, brought about by $1 of resale, additional resale value at the current time T. So if I increase the current resale value by $1, by just let's add $1 to the machine, and immediately the machine becomes $1. <laughs> more valuable. I didn't mean just attach one dollar uh, on 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 the on on the, on the machine itself, but you somehow do something by using that dollar to increase the value of the machine. <clears throat> of course, if you put one dollar on the top of the machine, it will increase its resale value, but it will not increase its productivity. Um, but we mean by increasing resale value, not just attaching a dollar bill to a machine. Okay, so that's what you get. But because the machine is one dollar, it's gonna give you higher product. And that is at the rate of pi. So I get pi times one dollar product from now small t to capital T. 
and I discount that with row. So if you can take the one dollar product pi, go from t to small t to big t, and discount it by row, you get exactly this pi times divided by row times this. So this is exactly the value of x additional dollar resale value to you. This then gives you the second part. If that value is more than one dollar that I invest, then I should invest as much as possible. So if this quantity is bigger than zero, I should have a maintenance rate of U, capital U, as much as possible. If this is less than zero, I should have no maintenance. It's a bang bang solution given by this thing. But now let's look at this thing because this thing comes from this thing. This come, remember now this is lambda times G U minus E to the minus rho T times U. It is the coefficient of U in Hamiltonian. So the coefficient of U in Hamiltonian, once you substitute the value of lambda, once you substitute the value of lambda, you get this. <clears throat> this term, this term, the first term, first term and the second term together is this term. This term is the present value of the marginal return for increasing the preventive maintenance by one dollar at time t. Okay, this we already know. This is coming right from here, right from here. We already talked about this. But its effectiveness is g, so I have to multiply it by g. Okay, and then this is my investment, if I put dollar in the maintenance, I immediately at time t, that dollar is only worth that much to me at small time t. So that I have to subtract. <clears throat> Remember this is present value formulation. It's not a current value form. Current value formulation, this will be one. Present value formulation, e to the minus rho t. So this says that if the marginal return, this, this marginal return, of increasing the preventive maintenance by one dollar is bigger than the cost of that one dollar at that time t, then I should do that one dollar. I should maintain. And if I do it for one dollar, maybe I should do for two. And then I should just have the maximum. After that, I'm not allowed, so I cannot do it. But up to you, I'm allowed. So we have a very, very clean interpretation. <clears throat> the rest of the paper tells you two things. One is, you know, what is the characteristic of the solution? And the second one is how to find T. So the first one, if I rewrite this equation 9.9, .9, the term part, <clears throat> I get this. We can conclude that the expression inside the square bracket of 9.10, which is this part, is monotonically decreasing with time t on account of the assumption that the pi rho is bigger than one, because pi rho is bigger than one, then this is positive. And GT is non increasing with T right there. It follows that there will not be any singular control for any finite interval of time. Because it's strict changes in time. So this function cannot have a singular control for more than one point in time. So we can ignore it. <clears throat> And since this is zero for all t, we can conclude that the switching function can only go from positive to negative. 
So what Thompson is saying here, that the control in the lifetime of the machine will never go from zero to you, It'll only go from you to zero. So the solution can be either all you, or could be all zero, or could be you and then zero. All of those three can be written just this way. I can write all three of those like this. That means up to first TS, the control is U. Then after the switching time, the control is zero. Notice that if it's all U all the time, then we can just keep TS equal to zero. No, if it's all zero all the time, we're going to have TS equal to zero. If it is all U all the time, we can have a TS equal to e, capital T. <clears throat> so by having TS either zero or T or in between, I can characterize the solution by 9.11. So we need to find TS. Where is the switching point? Well, <clears throat> This is interesting, and this is, I think, the main contribution of the paper in some sense. Uh, the solution is come from the, the terminal time condition, this one. If you write the Hamiltonian in a full in right form, we get the following condition. Okay, so how do we find T star? That is, you cannot find T star without finding the switching time. So <clears throat> the interesting part of this paper now is that switching time and the optimal T star has to be found simultaneously. Okay, you, you just can't say T star without finding TS or vice versa. You have to have simultaneous solution of those. So this is where the paper talks about certain things. So let's continue. Which means that we need to somehow find this condition. And remember, if the switching time is before T star, that means the control change from u to zero then you know what x the, the, so what, what we're trying to do here is this we're trying to say that if ts is less than t star which means the control switch from u u capital u to zero before final time then the final time control is zero Final time control is zero. If that's the case, then by this condition, this is zero, this is zero, and we get x star t star equal to this. On the other hand, if ts is exactly equal to t star, then u star t star equal to u, and by putting in this capital U for U star T star, I get this. So you can see, <clears throat> depending on where TS is, capital T star has a different formula. That's what I mean by simultaneous. You can't do one without the other. Now, 9.13 is like this. DT is non-decreasing, and GT is non-increasing, and XT is non-increasing, because we know we cannot increase the value, we can only slow down its decrease. We can easily show 
that both of them will have a solution for T star. Okay. So that is not a problem. So let's do a numerical example. <clears throat> so this is this to say that by having this and this, and by showing the one on each one of them will have a solution, we can find in any given example both values. So so the next part of the paper is just give one example to see how you can do it. And you can sort of see that you can do that in every example you want. So this is the example Thompson gives you. And for this example, 9.3, which is the state equation, becomes this. Initial value of the machine is 100. And TS condition is nothing but the condition in the switching function to be zero. So notice that this is the switching function. And when the control switches from U to zero, this quantity will become zero. Exactly at that point, this quantity becomes zero. So we have the, we have an equation for that. So we have an equation for TS, and we have two equations for T star. And so we have to solve the TS and one of the equations for T star. Well, we have to find out which one. Right, so so that's kind of the idea here. So this is this TS, but this also involves T. And of course that T will be T star eventually. But which T star? This one or this one? Okay. So let's 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 go to the next one. If we can prove that the solution of this TS is strictly between zero and a T in the open interval zero T, then it's an interior solution. If TS is an interior solution, then things are easy. If it is not, then we need to do something else. But doesn't mean it's difficult, but we just have to take care. So substituting the data in 9.16, we have this, which simplifies to this. Now, integrating 9.15, now look what I mean by that. 9.15 is this equation. So I have to integrate this equation to find x not xt. So before ts, I must use the control one. And after ts, I should use the control zero. So when I integrate 9.15, for t less than ts, I find xt to be this. I just put u equal to one here, and I integrate this. It's easy to do that. And I, when I integrate that, I find xt equal to this. And then at ts, <coughs> I, I put the t equal to ts in there, and I have xts value. Then from that x ts value, I integrate after ts with zero control. And I get this. So given a ts between zero and t, I can easily find the solution of x t like this. Okay. So I have a solution of x t in terms of ts. If you assume since we have assumed this to be interior, remember we, we said, let's assume this is between zero and T. Then we obtain this condition. And we have to equal to this. Now, because we assume T has to be between strictly between zero and T, 
then the control at the end is zero. So I need this equation, this equation. That equation, 9.13, and equation that we just derived. That one, and the other equation, 9.17, 9.17 is 9.16, 9.16 is this, and 9.16, what am I going on here? Did I do something here? Condition T is by 9.10, something. Just like this, we must solve this. Is it the same as solving that one? Oh, we have to find this value. And the, oh, I'm, I, I'm sorry. You have to find this value, which comes from here, which actually comes from here as well as here. And that value and this equation, they have to be solved something. I may have to write a little bit more to, to involve 9.13 in there. So make it a little bit easier to follow. And then, uh, uh, Kushal, can you make a note of that, please? <clears throat> so we have then <clears throat> find a solution of this, uh, which is by substituting one for the other, I can find TS, because the two equations, so in order to solve that, one can eliminate one variable from the one and solve the other, and then the solve the, once you solve for TS, you solve for T. So this, it's a transcendental equation, so you need to write a binary kind of search. So binary search gives us this equal to 10.6. And this is certainly between, between uh, 0 and 34.8. So interior solution works, and we have a solution. So we have a solution which says that Problem machine should be sold at 34.8 time units. And it should have a U control, full control up to this point, and then zero control after that. When you do that, the value of XT will go down like this, the resale value, which will be uh, a little bit slowed down because of the maintenance U. And after that, it will go a little bit faster all the way up to here. At that point, we sell the machine. So this is the solution of the problem under those conditions. And question then is, what if I give you a problem where this does not satisfy our supposition? Okay. Then we need to follow the procedure outlined in the earlier section, and this will result in either TS zero or TS equal to T. If TS equal to zero, we obtain T from 9.15, 9.18, which is exactly what we have here. If, if it's the other way around, then we need to substitute X into 9.14. So this one means TS equal to T, and we have to go to the condition 9.14, which is this one. So the other one was based on 9.13, but it, 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 we should write that clearly at one place or another. So now we need this guy. So it's a little bit of a trial and error, <clears throat> and, and you can get to that one. <clears throat> 
I believe there's one exercise in the book that gets into this, and then you have to do that. This is a minor extension. And uh, uh, I decided that <clears throat> this kind of maintenance is not so common. So change the problem to nonlinear problem. So in a paper in 1973 that I wrote, I decided to change the G function like this. Once again, <clears throat> G is not decreasing and concave. This is what my assumption is. And just so the problem is simple, I assume T to be fixed. I add G to be strictly concave. <clears throat> And I'll make some assumption on G sub T as well. My purpose was to apply the maximum principle and show a control that is more, more, maybe more interesting to me than the Thompson solution. So <clears throat> now what happens is that when you have the Hamiltonian and you set it equal to zero, you get a solution here. It's not bang, bang anymore. The bang, bang is replaced by 9.22. And I get U0 T. <clears throat> and in my paper there, I want to find out what this looks like and what the optimal solution looks like. So the first thing is what happens to this guy? So you can sort of say the following. How does U star changes? I have to find in the derivative of this solution U zero T. Because U star T is going to be either this or this. It's a set function. It's going to be a saturated amplifier function, zero U and U zero T. By that I mean the following. By that I mean this. If the U zero T is above U, then I use U. If U zero T is on U zero T, then I use U zero T. And if U zero T is below zero, then I use this. So you can see the Thompson control was like this, and then that. Jumps from U to zero. The new control, is U, then gradually declines and goes to T. In my paper that this model is based on, I can prove that this is decreasing. I don't go beyond that. I don't prove, uh, well, maybe I do, but this can also go like this. All you can show is decreasing. How it is decreasing may depend on the problem. Okay, and I think the one example, uh, one exercise in the book, uh, on which this this picture is based, is uh, happens this kind of decrease. So, <clears throat> the first part, the first part is G sub U is like this. We assume pi bigger than rho. If pi bigger than rho, we can see the denominator on the right hand side of 9.24 is monotonically decreasing with time. So the whole right hand side is monotonically increasing with time. And if I take the time derivative of this, we know that we know that this is increasing with time. So if I take the derivative, this is interesting now. If you take the derivative of this. I know the derivative, time derivative of this is bigger than zero. But the time derivative of this is exactly this. I take the GUT, I take the derivative with respect to T, then I take the derivative with respect to U and take the expression ZU0 dot T. 
I assume this to be, this I already know is bigger than zero by this argument here. And I have assumed something about GUT. You can see this is important here. I assume GUT, GUT is less than zero. Uh, depending on what you assume there, it may have a different solution. I assume this to be less than zero. So this is less than zero. So this becomes on this side. And since this is less than zero and GUU is less than zero, you can easily see that U0 dot is less than zero. It can be more complicated depending on what this is. This is less than zero, so we know that. This can be positive, negative, and so depending on that, what happens to this side? This side is zero minus GUT. GUT is less than zero, so this is <clears throat> continue to be positive in our case. <clears throat> And because this is negative, u0 dot is less than zero. <clears throat> this positive, this is negative, so this is less than zero. If this goes on this side and this becomes negative, then this is different part. But anyway, <clears throat> under our assumption, we can prove that. But we cannot prove the second derivative of u0 dot, which would give you whether it goes this way or this way. So now we have a sad function. We can find T1 and T2, and we can have this one and this one, and we have solution like that. <coughs> Any question? Because what I'm, I'm gonna do is not to cover the two models, but I'm gonna tell you what's going on, how those two models make advances on this and why we use those uh, <clears throat> is what I'm going to do. Okay. You see, uh, okay. So, First model <clears throat> that we do is a model by Kamin and Schwartz. Also people who took those course, Kamin and Schwartz wrote a book on control theory for economics people. And that book was before my book. And those guys are smarter than I am. <clears throat> They, they modified the book several times, whereas my book, uh, I wrote in 1983, and I modified the second edition was um, 2000. And the third edition was only recently. So only two revisions. Uh, their model went through several revisions. So <clears throat> definitely in the early days of optimal control theory applications, uh, they had a first mover advantage. And also <clears throat> the field of economics has more application of control theory than the field of management science. So our book was <clears throat> not as popular, let's say, as theirs in terms of people citing for maximum principle. <clears throat> but anyway, let's just, but I, I knew both of those guys and, and <clears throat> this particular model, what they did was they said the machines, you can have a machine that decline in, in its performance, but generally speaking, what happens is machine breaks down. So rather than machine declining in productivity, Kim and Schwartz assume that machine has the same productivity until it breaks down. But the breakdown probability increases over time. 
So this is another way of saying that the machine is becoming not as good. And that makes the problem stochastic. And what Kamen's first did was change the stochastic problem by a trick to a deterministic problem. We'll, we'll, we'll see what that trick is later, not today. And it is a trick. The paper was published in Maze Science. And many years later, I mean, a whole lot of people have published their papers based on Kamen Schwartz. I also published one in management science called um, How Should a Shoplifter Optimize His Shoplifting? Given that his shoplifting will make him susceptible to arrest by police. So the shoplifting is the value he gets and arresting by the police is the breakdown of the machine. You, you, you see the idea? <clears throat> I wrote that paper, I published that in management science uh, using the same methodology at came in Schwartz, changed the stochastic problem to the deterministic problem. Um, I, actually, I wrote my, my biggest claim to uh, 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 source of kind of thing is that I, 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 I got this idea that this is another way to interpret the machine replacement problem in the middle of the night. And I thought I may forget what I do in the morning. So I, without switching on the light and whatever, I scribbled on a piece of paper what I thought in the night. And literally next day I finished the paper and I submitted it to management science. There's a little story after that, but management science published the paper. And so this was one of the first papers that I wrote, not the first paper, one of the papers that I wrote like literally in a day or less, or a day or more maybe, but <clears throat> anyway, many other people wrote papers after my paper on thief and shoplifting thing. You will see some stories somewhere in a book. Uh, Many years later, Ben Susan and I come back to the same problem, and we formulate the problem as a proper stochastic control problem without a trick. And of course, we get the same solution, but our solution is a proper solution. And it justifies the trick, because trick doesn't 100% tell you that it is the right way to do it. And I sent my paper, Ben Susan, I, I sent my paper to Mort Camion. And Camion wrote me a letter saying, I'm glad to know that my paper was correct. <laughs> or at least the solution was correct. Just imagine if that solution was wrong and every one of us who wrote the paper subsequent to that paper was all wrong, which would be a terrible disaster. But anyway, they, so this is, it's a nice problem with a trick that changes the problem from stochastic to deterministic, and it's a rather interesting. Bob Lucas wrote a paper on research and development where you put some money in research, and all of a sudden, something happens. The research gives you some product, which is something that you can sell. And that was a paper published in Econometric or someplace, and uh, I told you he was the one who got the Nobel Prize. Not on that paper, but regardless. So, okay, this is the story of this one. So we'll cover that. I do want you, when you read the book, I do want you to really, really carefully read this. It, I have spent a huge amount of time on interpreting this terminal time optimality condition. You can see the interpretation go from here all the way to here, all the way to here, and all the way to here. It takes four slides for me to interpret that. It's, it's, a, it's a, a, by looks of it, this is a very complicated condition. But when you, when you provide the managerial interpretation, it becomes more transparent. 
So, given that our field these days, everybody is looking for managerial insight. And people publish the papers because they want something counterintuitive. Counterintuitive means it is intuitive until you find out the interpretation. Because once you find the interpretation, it becomes intuitive. If it's counterintuitive, it's going to be wrong. <clears throat> but it is because Immediately, we feel it's counterintuitive. And then we go into details of it. We find why this result happens. But once it happens, your intuitive is sharpened. And the sharpened intuition is no longer counterintuitive. So somehow or the other, our field seems to be very, very obsessed with such counterintuitive <laughs> insights that allow you to say, oh, I did something counterintuitive. But in the end, it is intuitive. OK. so. This is a good lesson for you to, to, to see how you can drill down to, it's not always possible, but when it's possible, it is worth doing it. So this is, please read it so carefully because it is, it is, it's a lot. The second model <clears throat> that I'm kind of proud of is that the obsolescence of the machine means I should buy a new machine when the technology of the new machine is so much better than the previous machine that keeping the previous machine is not good anymore economically. <clears throat> but then once I replace the machine, the problem doesn't, it's not over. So in real life, you need to buy a machine and then technology improves again, you buy another machine and technology improves again, you buy another machine. So machine replacement is a sequence of replacement, not just one replacement. So Thompson model just one replacement, and then what? What do you do after that? So it was an effort to see how we can uh, do this multiple replacement and put into a control theory framework. And uh, Story aside, what is happening in my model is that it is a model of continuous time and a discrete time. So that's why I I give you uh, well, it's it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a discrete time model, but I cannot solve this problem in continuous time. I don't know how to how to no well no you can you can there are some some papers people have done it afterwards, but it's not so easy. It's, it's a better formula than discrete time, and I am able to give you the optimal sequence of replacements on this problem. And it is a mixture of control theory, discrete time optimal control theory, and some dynamic programming of a special type called the Wagner Witten algorithm. And so that's another thing that comes into the play, and I wrote this paper uh, as another extension of Thompson's paper, but both came and Schwartz and this paper are a serious extension of Thompson, you know, in the sense that they bring the problem to a completely different setting and allow the different techniques to solve that problem. So that's uh, what we will cover. Uh, and I'm hoping that my voice will be good next next week. And we will also um, go to chapter 10. Because now I, I covered one third of nine, and we will cover the other two thirds. So hopefully we can also do one third of chapter 10. OK, so please read the whole of chapter nine. If there are questions on set you know, on a Thompson model, we can go over it again if you want. Uh, you already have the exercises, uh, homework. Kusali will tell you the homework again, or you already given it to them. I'm I'm just gonna go over it quickly, and I'm also gonna send out an email. So it's eight point nine, eight point sixteen, 
and 9.5. Again, it's 8.9, 8.16, and 9.5. I'll send out an email as well. Okay. I don't want to cover the Cam and Swartz because we won't even have time to cover that model. And so we will call it a day. And I will see you next Thursday. If there are any questions right now, please ask right now on what we have covered so far. We have time to, to address the questions. Any questions? No questions? Okay. We'll see you next Thursday then. Thank you, Professor. See you next week. Yeah. Bye bye. Thank you, Professor.